Alan Turing was born in the year 1912 in London. It soon became clear that a very talented boy arrived on the island. For example, it is reported that he taught himself to read within three weeks and he was drawn to numbers and puzzles early on. Alan was very interested in science and after school he studied mathematics in Cambridge. Then in 1936, when he was 24, he published a paper titled On Computable Numbers with an application to the Entscheidungsproblem by Alan Matheson Turing. This work dealt with the question of decidability posed by the German David Hilbert in 1928. The problem was the following. Is each possible question in a given mathematical system decidable? Or in other words, can you find for each possible yes-no question an algorithm that answers this question? For example, let's take the natural numbers, where you can ask, is number x even? In this case, it is easy to find an algorithm that answers the question, namely, yes, if the remainder of x divided by 2 is 0, and no otherwise. But are there perhaps questions that can't be answered? In the following years, there have been developed three different solutions to Hilbert's Entscheidungsproblem. The first was published by Kurt Gödel in 1931 in his paper Über formal unentscheidbare Sätze der Principia Mathematica und Verwandte Systeme 1. The second in 1936 by Alonso Church in A Note on the Entscheidungsproblem. And finally, Alan Turing shortly later, also in 1936, in his famous paper. All three colleagues used different methods for their solutions. But today, we only focus on Alan Turing's idea, who specifically invented a machine for his proof. This thing was only hypothetical and it is today called by his name simply the Turing machine. Alan has already made himself comfortable in his chair to explain his invention to us. A Turing machine uses an infinite tape as storage device, which is divided into separate squares. Each square can store exactly one symbol. We start with an empty tape, where the squares initially carry a special symbol called the blank. At one point in time, the machine is only directly aware of a single square, which Alan named the scanned square. The symbol within the scanned square is called the scanned symbol. The machine is able to read the scanned symbol, print a new one, erase a symbol and move left or right. For remembering things, Turing gave the machine an additional small storage and called it the M configuration. At startup, the M configuration is set to an initial value, for example, let's say A. When the machine runs, the M configuration can change, for example, from A to B. So now we saw the three things that can be altered in a Turing machine, namely the contents of the tape, the currently scanned square, and the M configuration. Together, they define the full state of the machine, which is then called the complete configuration. The program for the Turing machine is stored in a table. Here is Alan's sample program number one from his paper. 
The first two columns define the configuration with the current M configuration and the scanned symbol. In the third and fourth column, the behavior is defined by the operations on the tape, like printing or moving, and the final M configuration. A given M configuration together with the currently scanned symbol define exactly which operations should be executed and which next M configuration should then be loaded. So now let's run the example. The machine starts in M configuration B and the scanned symbol is a blank, which is called none in the table. Therefore, the first line is selected and then the defined operations are executed. First, a zero is printed to the tape, then the machine moves so that it scans the square immediately on the right of the one it was scanning previously. At the end, the machine goes over into the final M configuration C. So that was the first step. Next, the machine checks again the M configuration, which is C, and scans the symbol that is a second blank. Then it looks for a matching configuration, finds the correct line, moves right, this time without printing, and then changes the M configuration to E. In the third machine cycle, we find again the matching column this time we print 1, move right and then enter the M configuration F. In the last row, we again move right and then switch back to M configuration B, which was the first configuration and therefore we have implemented a loop. So Allen's simple machine is printing alternating zeros and ones to infinity and beyond. Maybe you are not so impressed by a program that just writes zeros and ones. Okay. So let's show another one that is doing at least something useful. What about adding a one to a given binary number? The initial M configuration is B. In the first line, the input number is written to the tape, namely one, zero, 1, 1, which is decimal 11. Then we switch to M configuration C, where the adding program starts. For M configuration C, we have two lines, one for the scanned symbol 0 and another one for 1. This can be seen as something like an if-then-else statement. Because the scanned symbol is 1, we switch to line 3, where the addition 1 plus 1 is done and the result 0 is stored on the tape. Then we move left. We still have to process the carry and therefore stay in M configuration C. Another 1 is read and we do the same operation again. Then we read a zero and therefore switch to row two, which is the other branch of our if then else statement. There the processing of the carry is finished and we then enter the M configuration D, where the machine finally halts. Well done! The Turing machine has computed the correct result which is decimal 12. So what are the important steps? First, we have a question that should be answered by an algorithm. For example, what is x plus 1? Next, we have to encode the input in a way that is understandable by the program. In our example, we encoded the decimal number 11 in binary. The program writes this input to the tape. The algorithm to answer the question is stored in the table. It loads the initial M configuration and then executes the program. 
which works on the input and then writes the answer as output back to the tape. If the input is valid, finally it enters an accepting state and then holds. Modern descriptions of Turing machines normally use different terms. The M configuration is called the state. The mechanism to read and write from the tape is called the read-write head. In general, it is assumed that the input is not written by the program, but instead it's copied to the tape in a separate initialization step. One operation in the table normally consists out of a single write and a single movement. Finally, the program is called the action table. Now that we saw how a Turing machine works in principle, you may ask, what can we calculate with it? Well, for example, arithmetic operations like addition or multiplication. But we can also answer real-world questions like which bird is on this picture or which song is currently playing. But before answering those questions, we have to digitize and encode the real-world objects and write this representation to the tape. Sounds somehow unbelievable that such a simple machine can do all this, but yes really. In principle, Turing machines are as powerful as desktop computers, smartphones or even supercomputers. And it is said that also quantum computers cannot calculate more. Believe it or not, until today nobody has found a more powerful computing mechanism. There is a term that describes this computational power, namely Turing complete. If a system is Turing complete, it is able to calculate everything that also a Turing machine can do. Or, in other words, it is able to simulate any Turing machine that can do this work. And by the way, almost every programming language is also Turing complete. So which features are required to make all this possible? The Turing machine has an endless tape, which is the memory of today's machines. Then we need a place for storing the program. The read-write head is used to address the memory. Today's machines have a memory bus for this purpose. The M configuration stores the state of the program. This is something like a program counter or line number, which remembers the current location in the program. Then we have some instructions that can be used by the system. Namely, read, if then else, write and go to. So if your machine or programming language has at least these features, it is probably Turing complete. Ok, but what about the human brain? Is it also Turing complete? We can save information and afterwards remember it. We can make decisions. And we can simulate any Turing machine by hand, as we have seen just some minutes ago. Therefore, yes, we are Turing complete. Ok, cool. But perhaps we are even better than a Turing machine. Here, we should be not too optimistic. Alonso Church and Alan Turing claimed everything which is intuitive computable is also Turing computable. So for each problem where we can find a description to solve it, there must exist a Turing machine. In other words, if you can teach someone something, you could also formulate the rules in a program that implements what you have just described. So perhaps Turing machines are as intelligent as humans. But this is just a thesis and therefore not yet 
approved. Some more words on theory versus reality. Turing machines are so powerful because they are only hypothetical machines with infinite memory and irrelevant speed characteristics. But real machines are limited. Your problem must fit into the memory. For example, if the picture of the bird is too big for your machine, you can't find out which bird it is. Also, the processing speed must be sufficient for your problem. If you want to forecast the weather for tomorrow and your program needs a week to calculate this, well, it does not help much. Finally, a navigation program on a computer that weighs a ton and has the size of a building will probably not be very useful for guiding you through a foreign city. Therefore, we have so many different types of computers. But let's come back to Turing's paper and his proof of the Entscheidungsproblem. Up to now, we used exactly one Turing machine for exactly one problem. In his paper, Alan Turing generalized this and showed how to build a machine that is able to execute every other possible Turing machine. He called this more general thing the universal machine. First, every normal Turing machine must be encoded and then written to the tape. To show how this works, we again take our first example from before. The M configurations are encoded with the letter A, namely B as 1A, C as 2As, E as 3As and F as 4As. Then the print operations are encoded with a P. The move operations are encoded with R for right and L for left. For the symbols we use a single C for blank, for zero double C and for one triple C. Finally, we use a semicolon as separator for the different lines. So now the machine is fully encoded. Alan Turing called this scheme the standard description. Now let's copy the encoded table to the tape. This is somehow similar to loading a program in a von Neumann computer, where the program and the data is stored in the same memory. Finally, Alan Turing used the known instructions to write the universal machine that was able to read any other machine description from the tape, execute its operations and so could create exactly the same output as the original machine. So in other words, the universal machine simulates the other machine. Or you can see it also as a Turing machine interpreter. Today, this new machine is called the Universal Turing Machine or shortly UTM. A UTM can simulate any other Turing machine, any real world computing device or any programming language. So of course it is also Turing complete. Or the other way round, any Turing machine, real world computing device or computer language that can implement a UTM is Turing complete. As an example, we implemented a UTM in the C programming language, where any possible Turing machine can be specified in a simple array. Instruction after instruction is read in a short loop, which then simulates the behavior. So let's run the first 0, 1 printing example. And then our binary at plus one example. Seems to do the right thing. 
with his universal machine, Alan Turing now had built the tool for the final proof on the Entscheidungsproblem. To answer the ultimate question, is there a Turing machine for every problem? The proof is a little bit complicated and for ordinary mortals not really trivial to understand. Therefore, in the following we just show the idea of the proof. Ellen investigated if it is possible to write a program that can decide if another program will halt or loop. This problem is called the halting problem. As shown before, it is possible to encode and write any program to the tape. So now, together with the program P, the input I is written. Then we assume that there is a Turing machine H that is able to answer the question if P does halt with input I. So we feed into H the program P and input I. Then H reads P and I from the tape, somehow simulates the behavior of P and returns yes if P would halt and no if it loops forever. So if we put our first example program into H, H would say no, because the program loops. For the second program it would say yes, because, as we saw, the addition plus one halts with the input 1011. For the proof, Turing now expanded H and built a program H plus around it. H plus is basically the same as H, with two extra lines of code. Namely, if H says yes, we loop. If H says no, we halt. Then we feed H plus into itself as program and input. Now H analyzes H plus. If H plus Halt, H will say yes, which results in a loop of H+. If H+, would loop, H has to say no, which would make H+, halt. So this is a clear contradiction and H seems to lie all the time. So the result is, the halting problem can't be solved by a Turing machine and therefore it is not decidable. If you feel now a bit like this gentleman, don't be afraid. The idea of negative self-reference is hard to understand by the human brain. Similar to the impossible drawings from MC Escher, the liar paradox, or simply the question, what would happen if Pinocchio says my nose is currently growing. Anyway, let's come back to the starting point, namely the Entscheidungsproblem posed by David Hilbert. Since Alan Turing showed that the halting problem is not decidable, which is a special case of the Entscheidungsproblem, he proved that the Entscheidungsproblem is also not solvable. Good to hear, since his colleagues Kurt Gödel and Alonso Church came to the same result.